In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ has blessed me and my wife with six living children, including two sons, six-year-old Paul Gerhardt and four-year-old James Athanasius. Now, as a Lutheran pastor, I should have known better than to name my two sons Paul and James. I should have known that giving them that, those two names would mean that they would be forever locked in battle against one another, constantly fighting, and to this point of their lives, they've certainly proven that to be the case. Today we have the classic struggle between Paul and James set before us with our two readings from Paul's letter to the Romans and then also James' epistle as well. In Romans 4, Paul speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from his works. But then James chimes in and says, a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So which is it? Both. Your pastor, your parents, your Sunday school teacher, your youth leaders, and more have faithfully taught you that you are saved purely, completely by God's grace in Christ. If anyone should ask you if you are saved, you can say with a resounding yes that you are saved without doubt, with complete certainty, because of what Christ has earned for you by his cross and resurrection. And if anyone should ask you if you have saving faith to trust in Christ, you can again say with resounding certainty, complete certainty, that you have such saving faith because it's been given to you by the Holy Spirit working through the word that you might trust in Christ. And it's all about that grace and favor earned by Christ, delivered by the Holy Spirit through the word, that means that you know with certainty that you are in a right relationship. You are righteous before the Father. You have the Father's favor. He smiles upon you purely because of what God has done for you in Christ and delivered through the Holy Spirit. In other words, your works cannot save you, and that's okay because Christ's work has saved you in whole. Christ has done it all. That is the certainty that is ours in Christ. No doubt. But we sinners have a way of taking that perfect gift and perverting it to ends that God does not desire. We even pervert the gift of perfect righteousness before the Father, all for the sake of Christ. It happens when we say... I know I don't have to do good works in order to be saved, so I guess I don't need to do any good works. That's a perversion because it contradicts God's word. That is what James is so concerned about. James knew, and Paul knew it as well, that salvation does not undo God's commands. In his word, God tells you to love your neighbor he even tells you to love your enemy. Jesus did not overthrow those commands. He fulfilled them on our behalf, but they still remain God's righteous commands that we are called upon to fulfill. You are called by God to love others. So James says that you are justified by your works. Your works cannot save you, but James is teaching that your works show others that Christ has taken hold of you. In the great hymn, Salvation Unto Us Has Come, we sing this truth in these words. Works serve our neighbor and supply the proof that faith is living. Think of it this way. Your faith will not feed your neighbor when he's hungry, but your good works will. And that is true with whatever your neighbor needs. So James, you just heard him tell you that if your neighbor is poorly clothed and hungry and you simply say to him, go in peace, be warm and filled, then you have not loved your neighbor. You're called by God to love your neighbor. And that means doing whatever is needed for their well-being. So how well do you love your neighbor? Ask that question about your closest neighbors, your family. 
How well do you love your parents by honoring the fourth commandment? How well do you honor and love your siblings by living out the eighth commandment, putting the best construction on a little brother or sister's action rather than assuming the worst? Or maybe over these past few days, your closest neighbor has been those that you have spent 20 hours as 12 people in a 12-passenger van in order to be here. And how are you reacting to them, especially when you think about the fact that you've got another 20 hours in the van with 12 people in that 12-passenger van, and how are you going to be reacting to them as a result? How well do you love your classmates? Not just the ones that you like and that you count as your friends, but also the ones that annoy you to no end. Do you avoid them? Do you give them the cold shoulder? And so it goes with every other human out there. They are all your neighbors. An honest reflection leads me to say that I do not love my neighbor as I should. There are things that I do toward my neighbor that I should not do, and there's things that I fail to do that I should do. The same thing happens with my words, and then we don't even want to begin to contemplate what goes on in here in my attitude and my thoughts. If you keep reading in Paul's letter to the Romans, you find him capturing this very well in Romans chapter 7. The good that I want to do, even towards my neighbor, I don't do. And the evil that I don't want to do towards my neighbor, that I keep on doing. It's frustrating. But that is no reason just to throw your hands up in the air and say, I can't do it. What's even the point of trying? Instead, you are called to keep striving to love your neighbor. That is your calling. And there is one reason for you to strive wholeheartedly and with out fear. You are not dependent upon loving your neighbor to be righteous before the Father. It is not how well you complete this that has anything to say about your standing before God. Christ has already won his righteousness before the Father for you. Nothing can rob you of what Christ has done for you. Your failure to love your neighbor cannot rob you, rob you of Christ's salvation. And that is the very reason that you can love your neighbor. Because you're not doing it in order to earn something for yourself. That would be to love yourself. Instead, you're doing it in the freedom of Christ's salvation. In other words, you love your neighbor because you are blessed. So says Paul in our readings from Romans chapter 4, as he quotes King David in Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sins. You are blessed. David does not say that you're blessed because your life is lived perfectly in accord with God's demands so that you love your neighbor perfectly. No, you are blessed be even when you fail to love your neighbor. Your lawless deeds are forgiven. Your sins are covered. The Lord does not count your sin against you. The Lord only counts what Christ has done for you. You are blessed because Christ has loved you perfectly. His good works prevail before the Father on your behalf. When the Father does his bookkeeping on you, he doesn't count all of your sin. He just counts what Christ has done for you. Everything that's demanded of you by God, Christ has done on your behalf. It's all yours. And so you see... Paul and James aren't in conflict with one another. And that means there's hope for my sons. And it also means there is hope for you. Your hope is not a wish that may or may not be fulfilled. It is instead a certainty because Christ has fulfilled every demand for you. Your hope will not disappoint 
For the Spirit is ever at work to deliver God's grace to you in Christ through the word. Your hope stands when you love your neighbor, and it stands when you stumble and do not love your neighbor because your hope is grounded upon the Father's love, earned by the Son, delivered by the Spirit in the word. You are blessed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.